I want to read a couple of short passages from the lectionary today. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age." In Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What I want to do today is just brush up on some information that I've had for about 50 years in my systematic theology class in Nashville. And it's just information as to what the Bible says about who God is. And I think it is also safe to say where God is at and what God is doing presently, I think would fit and go along with this. This section starts out with that 
inescapable question, is there a God? And if there is, what kind of a God is he? What kind of a being is God? And then after that is asked and answered, there's a statement that I think is one of the most important statements that any of us could, could have and make and understand. My relationship to him is the most important of all of my relationships. My relationship to him. Here's a little bit of information about who God is, who the Bible says that God is. That is the most important thing. Verses like John 4, 24 that tells us that God is spirit. And then it goes on to say, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What does it mean when we look at that verse, God is a spirit? There are two parts to that, two logical consequences of the fact that God is spirit. One, he is incorporeal, or he doesn't have a physical body, but he is a spirit. And the second one is, God is invisible. He is invisible. And that is how he can be in a lot of different places at the same time. Luke 24, 39 talks about God being incorporeal or he does not possess a physical body. It's of the very nature of a spirit that it does not have flesh and bones, Luke 24, 39. It is true that the Bible speaks of God having hands, feet, eyes, ears, etc. in Isaiah and Genesis. And these are to be understood as metaphorical expressions. The part about God being invisible... John 1, 18 says that no man, uh, Jesus said, no man hath seen God at any time. <clears throat> One thing to remember about God is, God is personal. This writer says, I prefer to say he is personal rather than say he is a person. He is a person would be appropriate to speak of one person. Since there are three persons in the Godhead, <clears throat> it is better to speak of God as personal. He is a person who thinks, feels, and acts. <clears throat> The fact that God is personal means that he is the living God which separates him from the idols who can neither hear, speak, or see. One important thing about God being a personal God, a personal or personal beings, and we are personal beings, <clears throat> We need a personal relationship with him. God is independent. God is not dependent upon anything outside himself for his existence. He is independent. God is infinite. 
in relation to space. God's infinity in relation to space is usually spoken of by the term immensity. Immensity refers to the infinity of God's essence in relation to space. 1 Kings 8.27 and Acts 17.24. The immensity of God forms the basis of his omnipresence. God is infinite in relation to time. God is eternal. He had no beginning and he will have no end. He has always been. The most common way theologians describe God's eternity is to refer to it as timelessness. It is said that God had no past and no future. Everything with God is one eternal now. Time is said to be a creation of God and will be terminated by him. Time is characterized by past, present, and future and has succession of events. Eternity has only the present, thus no succession of events. God, according to the Bible, is immutable, which means he is unchangeable. Well, the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is unchangeable in his essence and attributes. This unchangeableness of God is clearly taught in Scripture. Numbers 23, 1 Samuel 15, Psalm 33, and on the list goes. The natural attributes of God, God is omnipresent. Omnipresent speaks of a God as being present everywhere for a relationship to his creation. He can be in a lot of different places at the same time. Wherever we go, God is there, according to Psalm 139, 7 through 12. God is omniscient. This gets a little scary because God being omniscient, that means that he knows what we're thinking before we think it. And if you think about that, that sort of makes you what's the way you think whenever you know that God knows what you're thinking before you think it. So that's part of his omniscience. He knows himself and all other things, whether they be actual or merely possible, whether they be past, present, or future, and that he knows them perfectly and from all eternity. He knows things immediately, simultaneously, exhaustively, and truly. And God is omnipotent. By God's omnipotence, we mean that God can perform any act consistent with his nature. He is never limited in activity by lack of power. By omnipotence, we do not mean that God can do the ridiculous and the absurd and the absurd. There are many things that God cannot do. Titus 1-2 says he cannot lie. God is holy, and there seems to be a whole lot of information in Scripture about God being holy, our God being a holy God. One of the main themes of the Old Testament is the declaration and demonstration of the fact that God is holy in Exodus 15, 11. When we think of God as holy, we think of him as being absolutely free from sin in thought, word, and deed. There is not the slightest taint of sin in him. He is absolutely pure. As John says, 
In 1 John 1, 5, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is loving. That God is a loving God of love is made abundantly clear in Scripture. Deuteronomy, Psalms, Jeremiah. By God's love is meant his affectionate concern. It is expressed in the scriptures through the words love, loving kindness, compassion, and mercy. God is wise. The Bible says a lot about the wisdom of God. For example, Proverbs 3.19. God is a true God and the God of truth. Romans 1.25. He's real, he exists, he speaks, and he acts. Everything he says is true. All that is true depends upon him. Nothing that is true can be fully and ultimately explained without a reference to God. God is good. Holiness and love are specific terms that carry great force. Just a couple more. God is glorious. When we think of the glory of God, we think of his splendor. God is majestic. His royal dignity. He is king of kings. He is kingly in the fullest possible sense of the word. And God is perfect. Perfect means complete. Every quality of an ideal person is present in God. Just an observation, there's four basic values. Holiness, love, wisdom, and ideals find their foundation in God. Holiness, love, and wisdom find their foundation in the moral attributes of God. Ideals find their foundation in the overall characteristics of goodness and perfection. God has woven these values into the fabric of truth. If we ignore them, we do it to our own hurt. If our life and thought are guided by them, they form the foundation for true thought and a happy life. <clears throat> how we live and think affects how we act. So just a little bit of reminding information about who God is and how God loves us and cares for us and will continue to do so until he takes us to be with him. Stand with me, if you will, and we will sing a verse. <clears throat> 